Oh my god, okay. Um, morning, almost afternoon. Uh, my name is Miguel Zuniga. I'm from Symantec Cloud um, CP, uh, which is the um, Cloud Production Engineering. So um, today I'm going to talk to you about um, this little topic, which is, could you please pass me the pass? Um, on the last OpenStack Summit in Vancouver, we went through a really deep into what we were plans of how we were going to architect, which were the technologies that we were looking into it. And this is pretty much, I wanted to use this time to make it like a follow through and also introduction on how we're doing things in, sem in semantic. Um, so first of all, uh, let's just jump into a really quick agenda so you guys can actually go over and see. Uh, for those who have seen my other talks, you know that I talk a lot, so let's just go through it. Uh, first of all, it's going to be creating the past. Uh, we're going to go through what we need, what were, uh, which requirements we were looking for, and exactly what we were, um, what, which is our main goal on creating a past here. Um, you'll see that it's a little bit more focused into something or into other type of users, not actually like the, the usual ones or the standard IT guys. Um, then after we go through all the creating and what we were looking for and uh, requirements, we're going to go into why we did it. First of all, the developer experience. That's pretty much the whole deal of a pass. If you look into bigger passes out there, uh, one of the biggest one is Heroku. The easiest thing is that any developer can go over and deploy anything that they want. That's the whole point of a uh, platform as a service. So once we've seen that, we're going to go into a little bit of microservices, what people is actually moving into for and moving into it and how it relates to containers. After that, we're going to move into which options we look into it. We basically made an kind of like a POC and analysis of multiple open source past projects that are out there. And we're going to just give them like a really what was good about them, what was not good about them, and which one we actually picked to go through it, and the reasons of why. After that, we're going to go through a really um, not really deep architecture of how we're doing pass at Symantec, but there will be some diagrams. You'll see how pretty much the developers are going to be able to go over and deploy stuff without worrying about infrastructure or anything else other than coding itself. So after that, we're going to leave for questions and answers. And that's pretty much it. It's looks like, it doesn't look a lot of content, but you'll see in a second. Um, so first of all, creating the pass. What was the whole deal of doing this stuff? The reason is that. Um, at Symantec, we already have cloud, which is IS. But uh, IS, as you know, involves doing a lot of things, knowing a lot of stuff in administration and all that kind of things. For a software company, it's way easier to just like hire more developers. And the fastest they can actually develop and automate everything, the more fast that you get products outside. So one of the things is pretty much allow the developers to facilitate deployments across any environment. In our vision, the pass should be able just like an abstraction layer where the developers go to and they just select where they want to go over and deploy, whether if it is in private cloud on, on top of OpenStack, on public cloud, or bare metal. Doesn't even matter where it is. They don't even have to know where it is. Just like go over and de decide, like, okay, I'm going to deploy inside of uh, private cloud or inside of public cloud. And that's pretty much it. Um, once they've gone through those stuff, the other purpose or the other requirement that we needed for creating the pass was remove all operational things and processes from the development teams. Why is this? Right now, a lot of the teams out there and application teams, they have a lot of developers, sysadmins, IT architects, and all that kind of stuff. If you pretty much abstract all that thing, you literally end up with development, real development teams that they don't have to worry about anything else. They don't have to worry about latency. They don't have to worry about uh, load balancers. They don't have to worry about networking. They don't have to worry about any piece of infrastructure at all. They just can focus into coding, which will give you a lot of more agility into it. And you'll see in a second why it's important, important to just remove the operational process, because it will give you agility to go over and deploy on every single commit a new version of the application, and you can see it right away. The next piece that we're looking into it is to provide scaling, self-healing metrics and logs. From, I mean, I'm a developer myself also. One of the things that I'm looking more into it is not like how the network set up or all that kind of stuff. I'm taking, I want to know like how many metrics I'm actually getting, how many sessions, how many uh, requests per second will you have, which are going to be logs 
what if you, my application gets some error? So this is something, these are the four main things that we're providing on PASS to allow the developers to just like keep getting all the data that they need out of their application in the different environments. After that, we're pretty much moving into continuous integration deployment. They don't have to worry about this stuff because the PASS already deals with it. It will go ahead and rebuild the application for you provision the application for you. You don't have to worry about going over and creating packages again. You don't have to worry about anything like that. Our main requirement was just like go over, hit, commit, push, and there you go. You get your new environment. So one of the other things that we're looking into it in order to have a lot of those type of automations is to have configuration management or a cloud management tool. Why is the reason of this stuff? Once you say, OK, let's say you architect your cloud and everything, how are you going to scale it? I mean, the easiest way is to create and to increase the pretty much the perform not the performance, the availability of a pass and the capacity of a pass is sit it, put it on top of IS. In order to do that, the fastest way to go over and just like provision more nodes or more nodes to your pass is just to use a configuration management tool. Whether if it is Puppet, Chef, Ansible, whatever it is, but you really need to have it in there. The reason is because once you start growing into it, the developer can go over and say, OK, um, I'm going to deploy this application, and I want to scale it and have a threshold between, I don't know, maybe a, a million requests per second and 500,000 requests per second. So that pretty much has to translate into how many VMs are going to be using to run that application itself, or how many containers you're going to be using to run the application itself. Configure all that stuff on the fly is really difficult, even with our tools out there like the uh, configuration management tools that you have, you still have to pre-warm your cluster that you're actually scaling. So it's really important you have something in, in there so you can facilitate your operations in itself also, I mean. Then jump into hybrid cloud. That's another uh, thing that we need. Hybrid, hy hybrid cloud in the past is kind of a tricky thing because you might think, okay, you know what? I'm going to go hybrid. I'm going to deploy inside of my uh, data center and outside. But that doesn't mean that you're going to be able to just go over and click here and everything will work smoothly. Be why? Because if you're sitting in one data center and your public cloud is sitting on the other side of the country, there's going to be latency. So that one also involves a little bit of software architecture and how you're ac architecting your application itself. Most of the times, uh, that's where microservices jump into it. And you can go hybrid and say, OK, all these services that require low latency, I'm going to deploy them on the path that is sitting or that is deploying inside of this data center and this other bunch of services on another place. And then you can just replicate the data into it with a Cassandra cluster or whatever you're actually looking for. Then, which is the technology that we require for containers? Docker. Why Docker? Even though there's right now um, CoreOS is, has its own uh, containers, there are a lot of containers are being out there for a long, long time. But Docker is pretty much the most popular, the most easy for the developers to use, and they can and pretty much follow up the same way that they're coding and create another Git commit to create new, another um, image in the Docker uh, in the Docker world. So pretty much both processes of development and actually creating new Docker images are pretty much aligned. So it's really easy for them to jump into it. So that was a huge um, requirement that we had uh, for us. And then after that, we had to do uh, multi-cloud. Same way as we go with hybrid. Uh, Multi-cloud, you can go over and have in multiple public clouds in different regions or inside of your private center in different uh, data centers in different um, regions of your public cloud. Doesn't matter. The whole idea is that the developer can go over and say, OK, I just made a new commit, push it into it, and the pass will automatically deploy your application in all the pieces, in all the places that you have specified without having to worry about anything else. So. Once we finalized all the requirements that we had, we started looking into why we're going to do this stuff. So we went into the development experience. That's pretty much what it's all about. That's, that's it. It's, it's not like automation. It's not nothing in there. It's the development experience. Why are we looking into this? Because a lot of the time, like I mentioned it before, when you're having a development team, a lot of the things, especially DevOps, the developers have to go over and learn infrastructure. And that's not really the whole deal. They're there to code. You know, it's not like they're there to create packages or to do something else or something, uh, anything you know, infrastructure related at. Whether when you have a pass, you have to focus into, you know what, just tell the developer to keep coding and push. That's the only thing. They don't care about anything else. You can just tell them, you know what, just push here and here is your URL of your application. Go over and check that it's up and running and it's, it's properly working. So 
as I mentioned before, the past environment, the main customers are developers. They're not admins, they're not architects, they're not DevOps. All of those guys are probably are gonna be customers of Fias, which is fine, it's not, it's not a big deal. But the same way as software as a service, your customers is the end user. On past, the customers or your end users are gonna be developers. That's the whole point of platform as a service. Then provide them with application templates and architectures is easy to use. The developers might know how to code, but might not know how to create a, an architecture of your application, especially if you're jumping to microservices, which is like small, is more business oriented than actually application oriented. But if you provide them with a specific application templates, like let's go over and say a small three tier application template, they can go over and follow up that same application template and just put it into something else and just modify the little pieces like, okay, you know what, instead of pulling the code from this Git repo, pull it from this other Git repo and it's this type of code or is it Go language, or if it is Java language, and specify it. You just give the templates to the developers to pretty much just like a form that you're gonna fill it up, and then the pass will basically bring all that instructions into it and build your application based on, on the, on the um, specifications of the developer. So once you have that, um, you pretty much reduce the operational complexity. You don't have to worry about anything else. It should be transparent for all of the developers. Just the whole goal is to commit the new change, push it, and see the changes reflected. You can have multiple environments on top of paths or multiple applications. You can go over and say, okay, this environment or this, um, I don't know, this application template is gonna represent my development um, application. This is going to be represent my test up, um, test environment. This one is the actual production. So when the developer is actually going over and committing into it, you can just go over and create one repository for each of the different environments, and the pass will basically pull down the new code, fix it up, merge it, or whatever it is doing, creating the new Docker image or whatever you're actually you're doing in the back, and we'll push it over to the to according to the specifications of the application that you're putting in place. Um, but that's not the whole deal. Applications are one part of it, but sometimes you need something that is going to be a little bit more persistent, which is the reason why we're providing backend services. Why is this? Sometimes the developers will require to have a route MQ cluster, a submission bus, or they require a Galera, or they want to use Cassandra or something else. These are basically backend services for the developer's application. It's not the backend services of the pass itself. So we have another layer of automation where the developers can go over and select, give me a Galera cluster. And the whole automation will bring up the Galera cluster, set up everything for them, monitor it, self-heal it, and pretty much just give the developers the IP or the URL of the Galera that you're gonna connect to. That's the whole main purpose of providing backend services. So, and one uh, other thing that we're actually looking into it, and that's something that a lot of people has to struggle sometimes, is make the clear line between stateful and stateless services. Why is this? Because of the different type of technologies. Stateful service, you can have it in there, you can set up a cluster. Stateful services are more like you need to have it running, whether it's something goes wrong or not, you still have to have it running. That's the reason why we're pushing into backend services a lot of this stuff. Whether on container world, you can have it running, but even if the container dies and brings up again another container and pl you plug back the volume into it, you still have a small piece or a small, uh, pretty much downtime on that specific container. So the stateless services is easy to go into container world and the stateful services just to put it in backend service. Um, because of the same reason. It's easier to just go over and kill, uh, I don't know, a Docker running Apache or your application on Rails or Java, and then just have everything separated on, uh, I don't know, Galera clusters uh, outside that is always up and running, no matter if it, but unless you lose the whole data center, it will basically kill the whole Galera cluster, right? But if you lose a VM, it won't mark any type of downtime. So once we went through like why we're doing this, uh, let me see. Already 13 minutes, okay. Um, once we went through all why we're doing this and that developer is gonna be the main customer, we decided to jump into a little bit of doing microservices. Um, why we decided to go this way? Because pretty much uh, aligns with the Docker world and Docker world and the technologies that I'm gonna show you in a second or I'm gonna talk about in a second. So first of all, um, doing microservices is hard. 
You have to pretty much, especially if you're coming from a monolithic application where the application is actually doing everything for you, splitting it apart and doing a service based on business logic and saying, okay, now instead of my application sending the email and actually doing the billing and doing something else and doing back and forward and creating user management and all that kind of stuff, you have to create like small um, departments, like the same way that you run your business. You have um, mail application and then you have another one that does the accounting, another one that does the billing in there. You have somebody and some other service that is actually keeping track of the users and you pretty much make them talk between each other. So jumping into those type of applications is easier if you just go over and give them like a small template like I mentioned at the beginning. Here is your template for a microservice. Go ahead and put it in place. If you need to create a template for another microservice, use the same one. Just point your new code or your actual Git URL to that that specific uh, template and let the pass actually build the application for you. After that, you can just pass over and make one service communicate to the other. Um, when I talk about services and I'm saying like it's more like a, the whole mold, or you can see it as a small monolithic application that is going to be a specific um, business function tied up into a group. So inside of that microservice, you're going to have a database, a uh, web server, or whatever it is that you're doing. Now and you create another microservice, which is going to be another business um, or oriented to another business part of your another part of your business, and that will also be doing some other things. And then you have both of them talk through APIs. That's pretty much uh, what we're trying to move into it. Um, then we, to have this stuff up and running, you have to provide persistent backend services for the same reasons that I mentioned uh, um, before. One of the other things that we're taking a lot in account is the support of languages. Right now in our past, we can deploy Django, Perl, Go, Java, Java in multiple versions of, uh, of uh, web servers or application servers, and Ruby, uh, multiple versions of Ruby, even C. So it's pretty much to give them the whole idea is to just have the developers. I'm going to create something new. This is the app lead, the language that I'm going to pick up, and this is the app and the template that I'm going to be using. Just push them forward and start coding, and you can actually go over and let them let the pass actually work in there. Um, keep your Docker image locally on private repository. This is something because it's specifically to Docker, you know. And I had to put it in there because you have no idea how many Docker things I found in in. Docker registry, like a lot of things that shouldn't be there because developers just go over and say, okay, just push and just push and push. And yeah, <laughs> you end up finding a lot of really cool stuff in there that shouldn't be there. And I mean, from coming from us, we basically, our way of deploying is that we have a private Docker registry in each data center that we basically pull everything from Docker itself in there, but air, all the past environments and all everybody that is using Docker is basically pulling from those registry inside. And Jump into a really quick um, diagram. This is what we're going after. And this is the whole target that all the developers should have in semantics. Just like you have your monolithic application. Some of them are pretty much in the second part, in, the, in this section in the middle. But the whole purpose is just to just jump into this place. Where each of them is a microservice, that you have them, you can have one, two, three, many of them. And you end up like talking to each other through APIs. This will allow the pass to just like have the same type of um, services back and forth, and you can move it around. With whether if you're deploying your pass in public cloud and then you're jumping into private or into private and then public, the whole idea is that since it's just an abstraction layer on top of IaaS, it won't matter if you're running on AWS and Google Compute Engine or OpenStack. It will be the same thing over and over and over. So the same one-click deployment that you have inside of your private cloud, you can have it outside if you wish. Okay, so now I actually I need to talk a little bit more on this one. Let's just jump into the cool stuff. Past technology options. Here we did uh, around six, around six um, demos. First of all, days or yeah, days. Days. What is days? This is an open source um, pass um, project that it's out there. It's really new. It's open source com completely. It's based on Heroku, but it's not there yet. One of the problems is that um, it uses a CLI that has everything built into another huge application that runs on the server. There's no way of actually running 
and expanding this stuff. It works fine if you're actually jumping from like a dev environment where you're gonna be deploying or you plan to deploy into Heroku afterwards. Works fine, works pretty much similar. You can use it to play around, but not to actually go over and just deploy something into production with it. Um, it has potential, it has a lot of future, there's active development into it, uh, but it wasn't something that we needed in there uh, or that was already there that we could actually use. Then the big guy in the, I mean, the big kid in the straight Cloud Foundry. Believe it or not, we say no to it. Why we did say no to it? First of all, the Docker support. Cloud Foundry decided to add, um, to add Docker into Diego release, and if you go to Diego release, it's incubator, completely incubator. So they might have a lot of time doing uh, pass services in the past, but it's not using the application or the technology that we're going after. So that was one of the that was the reason of why we didn't wait with it. Um, it didn't meet pretty much our needs. Cloud Foundry is, has a lot of the things that we're looking for into um, like the requirements that we're looking oh, sorry into the requirements that we're looking into it but like I said uh, our deal breaker was the docker support um, they supposed to get out of uh, incubator in the next I don't remember I think it's in the next few months or something yesterday okay yeah well there you go um, the only thing is that uh, for us we're already just like working out on the other technologies then um, after we play with those two, we decided to go into a little bit more Docker type, a open source Kubernetes. That's pretty much where we were around in May um, on the OpenStack Summit. We're playing with Kubernetes Mesos and Kubernetes Mesos project. Um, back then it was working fine and still it works fine, but from the development point of view, it was a lot of things that they had to look into it. A lot of huge JSON files that it created like a bunch of pods in Kubernetes and all that kind of stuff and all the requirements that they needed. It wasn't user friendly at all. It works pretty well. I mean, it works. Uh, Kubernetes is a really solid project. There are some few bugs. There's a lot of development into it, a lot of push into it. They've been releasing a new, uh, they just released a new version, like I think it's 1.01, .01. but still, um, a lot of things are driven by the community itself. Um, the reason why we didn't went with it is because we had, if we went with Kubernetes only, we had to pretty much invest a lot of time into the user experience, which we didn't have time back then. So we decided to just move into something similar, which is based on, on Kubernetes, which is OpenShift. OpenShift, like, uh, like you can imagine, is, um, is from Red Hat itself. OpenShift version 2 was something like on their own way, their own way of doing things, their own stuff. This time, they literally grabbed the Kubernetes code. They keep developing on Kubernetes. It pretty much um, a lot of the changes that go into Kubernetes on into the main project is based on Git pushes and pull requests that Red Hat is actually pushing into it, or the community from Red Hat is actually doing. So. It's really good because they didn't modify anything from Kubernetes, and if Kubernetes goes over and adds something on top of it, uh, OpenShift pretty much just pulls down the new code, adds their uh, API on top of it, and that's pretty much it. It doesn't even mix, doesn't even change anything. Once you deploy OpenShift, basically you have two API endpoints, the Kubernetes API endpoint that is basically running everything in, in Kubernetes itself, and the OpenShift API point that takes care of a little bit higher level things, like for instance, the um, user management, the source image, the SDN, and all those pieces that uh, Kubernetes is not working on it, like if you go right now and deploy Kubernetes, you still have to deploy, um, you have to deploy open B switch or something else to actually do the SDN layer on, of the pass environment. On OpenShift, it already has it in there. And not only that one, OpenShift, uh, they have a way of creating plugins for different SDN sections. So we start with SDN using open B switch or it's called open, OpenShift, op OpenShift OBS switch uh, SDN, and now we're actually moving into OpenShift with Contrail. The reason we're moving to Contrail is because our IaaS infrastructure is running in Contrail, and we're going to be pretty much merging both layers. Instead of having something that IaaS is doing with SDN and Contrail, and then having another layer that Pass is actually managing on top of that one, the whole point is that we're going to be merging both of them. So at the moment we deploy in there and the Pass clusters, we're not actually using a second SDN layer, we're literally using the hypervisor control layer 
to maximize the performance. The reason of this is because even if you go into AWS and deploy it, the Kubernetes itself, whether if it is with the CoreOS project, which I don't remember which is the networking part, um, or you go with Open vSwitch, you'll have a hit, uh, a hit on the performance about 30% if you know how to configure open vSwitch properly. If not, you're gonna end up with probably around 60, 60% 60 of loss of, uh, of performance on the network. But with control, we're pretty much gonna merge that one and we're gonna see if we can actually reduce everything around to 5% of uh, loss. So the other thing that we have in OpenShift is the source to image. Basically, the developer just commits, and they have their really nice hooks that go to GitHub, pull down the image, create a new Docker image, and literally deploy into it and they have user multi-tenancy. This is all this stuff, uh, except for the source to image. Everything else is inside of open you know, on Kubernetes. Like the user and multi-tenancy is already in there, but it doesn't, it's not user-friendly, and you have to call a lot of things into it to make it work. And also the security context, that's something extra that uh, Red Hat actually pushes into it, which allows you to go and define, I want to run this uh, Docker container for this application with the user 1000. And that's it. You don't get to use any other type of user. That's the only user you're going to be able to. Also, in the security context, manages the um, network assignment per project or per container, which allows you to go and define, OK, if you have a Kubernetes cluster, which is running five different applications, this one belongs to this user of this project. This one belongs to this other one. Even though they are running on the same host, it's not going to allow them to actually talk to each other doesn't even matter if you have Docker running on the same host and different applications in there, um, because the way Kubernetes runs is that you usually have everything inside of a pod talks to itself on local host. But if you have another pod, it will basically create another like loop back in uh, connection into it so that the, those containers can talk also into local host, which is a security concern. But with the security context that these guys added, it's pretty much, it goes away. So uh, this is pretty, these are on four of the, all the six that we look into it. And then, unfortunately, I had to give the bad side of this stuff also, which is Murano. It's not a bad side. It's actually an application catalog. Mirantis created it, um, but it's literally an application catalog. It, it's really good at it. It's really good at it does, but it doesn't give you the user experience that we're looking into it. They didn't look into what we were looking at or what we were at going after into it. So we decided to move into OpenShift because of it's, it's not actually a pass environment. You know, With Murano, you have, still have to have OpenStack. With OpenShift, you don't have to have OpenStack. You can go and deploy the same configuration set into AWS, into Google Compute Engine. It doesn't even matter where you're running. Or if you have uh, just a vanilla OpenStack, you can just go over and deploy it in there and then have another vanilla OpenStack or something else in there. Or like, for instance, that you have um, Liberty and you have Juno and you have Kilo. You deploy pass on the three of them. It doesn't matter where it is. Whether here on the OpenStack project, sometimes you have requirements. That is just like you have to plug it to Keystone, you have to plug it to other stuff, which is not really something that we're going to look into it. And the other one, which is Magnum, which is not even there. I mean, it's really new for OpenStack. It's something that we try to actually put in place. It's more like container management than actually, um, a, than actually a pass environment, like a platform as a service. So those were the three of them that were looking into it, and I'm no, sorry, the six of them, and that's the reason why we went into OpenShift. Um, the next thing we're gonna move into it, and we can go through questions after. Uh, this is probably the first uh, talk that I'm gonna leave time for questions after, if I have time here. And then we're gonna go into pass, what we're doing here. This is pretty much the whole um, really sketchy setup, or pretty much just a sketch of what we're doing here. Um, as you can see, this is just a section of the pass. I have another two diagrams that we're uh, going to look at it. And this is how the pass works. We have master nodes, we have infra nodes, and we have nodes. For the user, that's pretty much the only thing that they're going to look into it. Um, on the master nodes, they're pretty much in charge of managing the cluster itself of the platform as a service. The infra nodes, we will talk about it in a, little bit in a second. And the nodes itself, those are basically where the applications are running, where your application, the developer, the actual application of the developer will be running in there. After that, we have some requirements that we needed to, which is collector metrics, which the developers can actually go over and push into it. We have a storage server to provide persistent storage. 
Um, and the persistent storage basically goes into whether you want to use Cinder on OpenStack, or you can use Ceph, or you can use uh, NFS if you want, or it doesn't even matter which other, um, I think Ceph, Cinder, Ceph, AVS on, on AWS, but at the end, the whole purpose of the, of the storage thing is that making the APIs calls to whatever the cloud you're running into it and plug it into the nodes that are actually um, running on the containers and then passing the volumes as another, pretty much another vol Docker volume into it. And then you have your private registry. Um, after that, we have also the metric database, which is collecting all the metrics, not only from the nodes, but also at the container level. From the containers themselves, right now we're collecting metrics, which is CPU, memory, file system, and load. So we can have a really good description on how much your application is using. Um, based on, on the Docker metrics that are actually pulling out of each of the containers. We have the monitoring section, which allow us to basically auto-scale, not auto-scale yet, but it will auto-scale um, based on Kubernetes uh, replicas. And then we have nice dash, uh, we're gonna have nice dashboards so that the users can go over and see graphs and things like that. So from this section, where happens most of the magic here is at this layer. As you can see, the second one, uh, everything from here down above is pretty much backend services for the pass itself. But the applications and everything that you're running into it runs here, especially in those two where it says infra node and nodes itself, and nodes. So let's talk a, lot, uh, a little bit about the infra nodes. What are the infra nodes pretty much? It's just another set of containers that are providing basic services, basic infra services to the developers so they don't have to worry about nothing. They go over and create, manage the load balancer for them, they collect the logs, they create the Docker images for them. When, for instance, let's say I'm going over and creating a new git push, or I do a git push into my uh, repository, pretty much the image builder detects the weapon, the hook from, or actually GitHub basically sends the, the JSON hook into, um, into our pass, that one detects it, pulls down the new version release, and starts building the new Docker image for it automatically. That one gets stored into the uh, Docker registry that we had here, down there, and if the developer wants to auto-deploy it, they just need to click the check mark to go over and start deploying it as soon as a new image gets registered into the system. So it's pretty much continuous delivery on itself. They just literally go over and push it they start getting the new image built and then start deploying it. You can go around and tell it, okay, I just want to push and I don't want you to detect anything at all, just remove the hook. I want to push and I want to build the image but don't deploy it, just remove the hook, uh, the, the deployment hook. So it's pretty much up to them where they're going to deploy it, if they want to auto-deploy it or not. And then also we're providing, it collects the container metrics, which I talked about already, and we have SSL Terminator and DNS resolution. Why is this stuff? Because um, when you create a new application itself, you should be able to have SSL certificates that you're gonna push into it. So on the application template, the developer can go over and pass and say, pull down the, this is the cert itself that is encrypted, or you can pull it from here and actually configure it on the load balancer automatically to do SSL termination in there. Right now, the load balancers are pretty much uh, um, software load balancers that we're using. But it's their Kubernetes actually adding support for not only, they already have Google uh, load balancer support, but they're going to add ABS support and also F5 support, which we're actually looking forward into it. And the DNS resolution, while we're doing this, uh, is because um, once you have the application up and running, your application r will be running in any of those other nodes, which the whole uh, the user will basically go and try to say, okay, my app domain go in there, and the DNS resolution goes over and tells you forward all the traffic into this specific node, which is running this container, which is the actual application itself. So um, once you have all those services in there, it's really pretty much transparent to a user, as you can see. It's not only for web applications, you can have any type of application. You can even go over and tell it, have an email server in there. Doesn't matter. It's, it will basically just run in a, a, I don't know, a send mail or a postfix container, depending on what type of container you are actually creating into it. And it will give you the URL also, or actually the domain, which it gets auto-resolved. And then you specify on the application template, it's running on the port 25, and, but internally on the container is running on port, I don't know, 2525 or something like that. Everything is managed automatically by the load balancer, which is also working as a router between the internal connectivity of the pass section itself. 
Um, so moving forward into this, and I'm almost running out of time here. Um, this small diagram is how the user experience works. They go over and just create a new application template, and they define the settings in there. How, how much they want to replicate, like how many um, instances of their containers are going to have, if they're going to be one, two, three, or five, if they're going to be stateless or not, if they're going to be using something like an, um, a certificate or not, and pretty much which image are you going to be running into it. Then platform as a service goes over and tells it, OK, is it a stateless application? Yes or no. If it is a stateless, go over and jump into OpenShift, which is the container management tool, which takes care of everything that I talked about a few minutes ago. Or if not, if it is actually something else, like provide a backend services, use the automation that we have in the cloud to provision, scale, configure, and self-heal the cluster that you're looking into it. Once you have both of them up and running, which doesn't have to be one application template for each of them, you have one application template for both of them at the same time, uh, they, you just literally have to go over and tell them, OK, connect this to this other IP, which is giving me the path environment, and there you go. You can access your database or something like that. Um, so after we decided to go into this, um, how it works, so here's pretty much the same way. The user goes over and jumps into, creates the push into it. Let's say well, I'm going to deploy again. Goes over, commits a new code, pushes into it, gets the image builder. Once the image builder is there, and if you have the hook set up and running, it goes through the same place. It goes over and says, um, the platform as a service, OK, I have a new image for something. I'm going to read the actual application template and go through the same workflow and decide where it's going to be running. On the, if it is going to be a stateless service, that's pretty much something that's more like that we're giving them to, like, you cannot touch. You know, you can go over and request a new stateful service like a MySQL 5.5, 5, or you can request a specific version of Cassandra, but they don't get to upgrade Cassandra itself. That's something that we provide them, and we go over and tell them, you know what, we have the Cassandra, the Cassandra version, this one, or we have this other Cassandra version, or this version of RabbitMQ. That's something that we're going to basically go over and provision for them automatically in the back. Uh, like for, I don't know, even if you guys want to use Hadoop or something. And you can just literally go over and tell them, this is the new IP into it, or the new uh, IP port that you have to connect your application to it. Um, so one of the questions that we had most of the time is how you define how to connect to what into there. So on the same way, on the application template, like all the settings that are actually getting built on the fly, for instance, which is the IP on the container, the, on the node that the container is running, which is the port, all that kind of stuff, is passed over through environmental variables to the application itself. So the users don't have to worry about, oh, you know what, I don't know which is the IP that I have to go or to connect to. They can just reference on their application amp um, application name underscore MySQL underscore port. And then amp application uh, name uh, MySQL underscore IP. And that's pretty much how you let the user connect to their services that they're running into it without even knowing what exactly is or where it's actually running. And with that in time, I let five minutes. Do I have 40? I don't even know if I have 40. Oh, yeah, I do have. OK, um, I'm going to leave like, the last four minutes to question and answers. Uh, thank you. Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the thing is that actually doing pass, like you said, is, is a lot of different pieces, you know? So one of the things that we're looking into is to see that we were trying to go after is, OK, we grab a pass itself, or we grab something in the back end and we build on top of it. And we even consider like creating it from scratch, like creating our own type of a Kubernetes type of things and all that kind of stuff. Um, but from the things that are out there and we look into it, uh, the ones that are, I mean, the biggest one is Cloud Foundry, you know, and that's pretty much gives you everything. Uh, the other ones were just like half into it. Uh, Kubernetes itself is more like, to be honest, it's more like job scheduler than anything else, right? It's, it's, that's pretty much it. The only thing is that OpenShift is twitching it enough and fixing it enough to actually make it look like a pass. And it gave us pretty much a lot of uh, pluses in there, especially, especially on the development experience type that we were looking into it. Okay, and another question is about the state, state, state application. Mm -hmm. what, what is the 
So we're using tools outside that are not a uh, OpenShift or anything. Uh, we, I mean, yeah, no, no. What is happening is that the the pass UI itself is is an Angular uh, an Angular JS application that is doing all the connections back to OpenShift itself, or is actually doing the connections to the other cloud tool. The one that we're testing right now is Scalar because it's open source. Is a cloud management tool, and you can define like specific farms in there. You're gonna go over and say, okay, I have all this. I had one engineer that figured out how to auto build one click deployment of a MySQL cluster, and then you can just go over and tell it, and on the pass UI, go over and clone that cluster and just start it up, and we'll basically go over and start it for you, give you all the IPs back into it, which are basically sent over to OpenShift. Yeah, so the whole idea is that on the, the OpenShift UI, we already had started commuting a lot of changes on, onto the UI. So one of the things that we added was pretty much uh, a services section where they go over and just define a Galera cluster, Hadoop something, or whatever it is. They just click it. That pretty much makes the backend API call to Scalar, which starts building everything and starts monitoring the farm itself. For us, the farm is just a service, a, a persistent service for a user. So for instance, if you go into the past and you say, I am going to need a, a Cassandra cluster, on the past, you're going to see just like, OK, Cassandra, click, deploy. What is actually happening in the back is that we're talking to Scalar and going telling them, OK, grab the, farm, the, the template or the actual farm of the Cassandra cluster, clone it, and deploy it. And that pretty much gets locked down to that specific user. But the, the lockdown from Scalar itself is just we lock down so it cannot actually get destroyed. Uh, it can auto scale or downscale pretty much uh, on the way, that, whatever it is. But on our context inside of the pass environment and in our database, we're telling it, OK, this user has specific Scalar ID of deployment, which is a Galera cluster itself. What we're doing is that once the deployment's up and running, it will give us the front end, the, the FIP, in case of OpenStack, it will give us the FIP, and that's what we're giving the user to actually in pretty much incorporate into uh, environmental variables so they can actually connect it back to their application. Is it exposed to, uh, to the users? No. Users no. no. It's it's it only no, no, DevOps. no DevOps. It's only developers. Is it a, a, a limitation? No. Why? Because the whole purpose that we're looking into is that we're going to target developers, not actually DevOps itself. If we wanted to go over and just have DevOps, most likely we're going to deploy some other tool or something like the Murano catalog or something that they can go over and actually use, but through IS. If they want to use, I mean, if it is more like DevOps thing that they want to go into it, they go into IS itself. If it is only development, they go to pass. Okay. So I have a question too. Mm -hmm. um, you, you told, oh, thank you. Um, you told about the services. They can plug in in your application if you deploy a Galea cluster, cluster or Elasticsearch or whatever. But you miss two things, I think, mm -hmm. because um, first, uh, all of these um, PaaS platforms, um, if, uh, uh, Cloud Foundry or whatever, um, this community services are really sucks because they are not uh, cluster ready or whatever. So mm -hmm. you need uh, a lot of manpower to to build new services to uh, to to your platforms. Mm -hmm. Or as you said, you you use external service providers. Yeah. Um, but then you have other problem because uh, if you're in Europe. Safe Harbor is cancelled now, and you can play status in America, so in US. So you need a European provider, and that is uh, not easy to find. Yeah. And uh, so we have two problems. Uh, maybe you find uh, a service provider in Europe, or you build your own services. So on that one, that's what we're doing. Wait a minute. So oh. we, we, we are uh, hosting now Cloud Foundry since uh, one and a half years a public uh, mm -hmm. uh, pass platform in Europe. And um, yes, this is a, a big thing because you have not really options. Yeah, I know. In, in our case, we are trying to, def to um, architect pass 
completely abstract of everything, you know. That's the reason why we went to into a cloud management tool. Because we're trying to have something that we're going to be able to deploy anywhere, doesn't matter where it is, and still have the same type of automation that we're doing in-house. Um, one of the things is that you see this type of cluster. This cluster, it doesn't, it's not just that one cluster that we have across for everything. We go over and deploy the same cluster in each of the data centers that we have running OpenStack, and it's going to be running on each of the regions uh, sitting on AWS or Google Compute Engine. So the thing is that when the developers want to go over and define something, they can go over and say, okay, I have this application template. I'm going to go over and roll it out in all the, in, in every single region of the cloud itself or in everything where I can go over and deploy. But the whole thing is that um, if you build something like a specific service, like you mentioned it, into some place and out of the nowhere you just like lose or they go out or they go out of, like uh, out of business or whatever, you get stuck into it. So in our case, so um, so for instance, we have the analytics team, which is doing our own Hadoop type of madness, right? That is going to be the same way that we're going to go over and deploy into whatever it is that we're deploying to um, Europe or here in, in, in Asia or over there in America. But the whole idea is to just like abstract and don't have any limitations. Absolutely, right? absolutely, but, uh, but it's, um um, to, to start to start your own uh, cloud uh, uh, path platform, self-hosted or whatever, or as a testing um, platform or whatever, um, you you don't have uh, the options to to really say, okay, please uh, attach me or please create me a Galea cluster and attach to my uh, deployed instances, uh, deployed uh, applications, uh, and. Mm. Um, you 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 have to spend a lot of money and a lot of of manpower to to get uh, really production ready. Mm -hmm. So um, so you have uh, two options. You you are using uh, such uh, something you know. in uh, like AWS service or something like that. Yes. Yeah. No. No. I know. We are aware of that one. Um, the only thing that we are looking into is that, like I said, it really depends on how they want to architect the application. Some of our teams are going to be just going over and deploying, like I don't know, some piece of us into pass, and the rest of them probably are going to jump into IaaS and do it themselves because I don't know, it's more sensitive data or something like that that they want to keep an eye into it better. Uh, we're just pretty much giving the options to the developers to go ahead, even if they go over and say, okay, we're building in top of pass and we're doing everything to agile and to make more more agile, the development itself, you can go over and they, if they want to, they can just go over and deploy in IaaS if they want. It's yeah. not something that you have to go over and yeah, right? Okay, I yes, mean, so that's pretty much it. Okay. Awesome, Thanks. thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. The automation tools, what? Complementary tools? Yeah, uh, so for instance, there are tools like, for instance, the collection of metrics is done by uh, Collecti, and we have also our built-in house metrics the system. The metric database is InfluxDB. Um, the dashboards is dashing. We use only open source projects. So that pretty much diagram is just like a mix of a lot of things running into it. So for monitoring, we're using Savix. Um, for what else did I put in there? I don't remember what else I had. Uh, hold on. Uh, monitoring Savix dashboards is dashing I/O, um, and also the uh, the dashboards from Savix itself. The storage is pretty much the, just the server running NFS itself or iSCSI. So that's pretty. That's it. I mean, it's not really a lot of things. Um, most of everything is centralized into OpenShift. Any other questions at all? No? I'm already past time, so really appreciate it.